Okay, here we're going to look at the following theorem dealing with an isomorphism of two groups. So let's say we've got two isomorphic groups, G and H, and it's exhibited by this isomorphism phi. Then we have these following five results. Then phi inverse is also an isomorphism, and that goes from H to G. Then the number of elements in G is equal to the number of elements in H. So we're actually not going to prove that. That follows immediately from the fact that an isomorphism is a bijection. So I'll just put a check mark next to that. And then we know if G is abelian, so is H. If G is cyclic, so is H. And then if G has a subgroup of order N, so does H. So these last three say that a bunch of the structure from G goes over to H. In fact, all of the structure of G will go over to H. Okay, so uh, let's look at a proof. Good. So we know that phi inverse exists um, because phi is bijective. So that's what we'll use to prove one. So phi is bijective. And so that tells us that phi inverse exists and is also bijective. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is show that phi inverse um, satisfies the last condition for an isomorphism. So let's suppose that um, uh, U and V are in H. Great. So now, what that tells us is that there exists x and y in G such that uh, phi of x equals u and phi of y equals v. And so we, so we know that's true because uh, phi is onto. Great. Now the next thing we want to do is look at phi inverse evaluated at uv. But now notice that's going to be the same thing as phi inverse evaluated at phi of x times phi of y, given the fact that phi of x is u and phi of y is v. Great. But then, since phi is an isomorphism, we can mash these together, and that's going to give us phi inverse evaluated at phi of x, y. But now the phi inverse and the phi are going to cancel because they're inverse functions of each other. And that is just going to give us x times y. Okay, great. But now we can rewrite these in the following way. This means that x equals phi inverse of u. And this means y equals phi inverse of v. So we can apply that over here. And we have phi inverse of u times phi inverse of v. And then reading the extreme left-hand and right-hand side of this equation, we have shown the last condition for phi inverse to be an isomorphism. Okay, good. I'll clean up the board and then we'll move on to part two. Okay, so like I said before, we're going to skip part two. So we're going to move on to part three. So we're assuming that G is abelian and then we want to show that H is abelian. So let's go ahead and suppose that uh, u and v are in h, okay? Good, and notice that means that um, u equals phi of x and v equals phi of y, and that's for some x and y in g. And we know that because phi is on to again. Okay, good. Now let's do u times v, and notice that's the same thing as phi of x times phi of y. But again, that's the same thing as phi of x times y, given the fact that phi is an isomorphism. But now we have our multiplication inside these parentheses is happening inside of G. And since it's happening inside of G, we can commute it. So this is equal to phi of yx. And again, that's because we're inside G and we have assumed that G is abelian. Now we can apply the fact that phi is an isomorphism again to rewrite this as phi of y times phi of x, but then that's equal to v u by our assumption. So again, looking at the extreme left and right hand side, we have u v equals v u, but what that tells us is, is that uh, h is abelian. So let's write that down, h abelian. Okay, 
sick. So let's go ahead and look at part four, which is uh, that H is cyclic when G is cyclic. Okay, good. So now uh, let's suppose that uh, U is an element of H and it's any element of H and what we want to do is show that U can be written as uh, some power of a given element from H. And so now uh, notice that since G is abelian, we can write G as the cyclic subgroup generated by G. Great. Um, so the next thing we can do is we can write U equal G of X for X in G, but then recall that uh, G is equal to the cyclic group generated by G, which tells us that X equals G to the N for some integer N. Good. But now, mashing these two ideas together, this fact that phi was on to, so we're, we were able to write U as uh, phi of X, and then this fact that G is abelian, so we can write X as G to the N. So putting those two ideas together, we get U equals um, phi of G to the N. But then again, because phi is an isomorphism, we can bring that exponent out. So this is phi of G to the N. Good. But now notice that element of U is contained within the cyclic subgroup of H generated by phi of G. So what that tells us is that H is contained in a cyclic subgroup of itself, but uh, we know that cyclic subgroups are obviously subgroups of the entire group H. So since H is contained within the cyclic subgroup of phi of G, which is again contained in H, that tells you that both of those groups are equal. So in other words, the, the group H is a cyclic group generated by phi of G, where G is the generator of uh, capital G. Okay, good. I'll clean up the board and then we've got one more thing to prove. Okay, so now we want to prove this uh, subgroup statement of this theorem. So we want to assume that G has a subgroup of order N and show that H does as well. So let's let K be a subgroup of G with the order of K equals N. Okay, good. And now the next thing we want to do is consider phi of k, in other words, the image of this subgroup under our isomorphism, and notice that's going to be a subset of H. So we'll have to show that that's a subgroup, but right now it's just a subset of H. But then because phi is uh, one to one and on to, we know that the number of elements in phi of k is equal to n. So right now it has the right size. So what we really just want to show is that this thing phi of k is in fact a subgroup, not a subset. So notice I'm using this less than or equal to for subgroup and then this like just subset symbol for subset. So we want to show that this is a subgroup. Now we're going to use the subgroup test. So we use this uh, quite often. And so what we, in fact, all, all we need to show is that if X and Y are in phi K, then X, Y inverse is in phi of K. Great. So I'll let you guys look up the subgroup test. We proved it and we've used it in a bunch of previous videos as well. Okay. So let's suppose X and Y are in phi K. So what that tells us is that X equals phi of um, maybe K1 and Y equals phi of K2 for K1 and K2 in this subgroup K. Okay, good. Now the next thing that we can notice is that K1, K2 inverse is an element of K and that's because K is a subgroup of G. 
Okay, good. But now what we're going to do is apply phi to both sides of this. So this tells us that phi of k1, k2 inverse is an element of phi of k. But now we can use the isomorphism rule for this. And notice that this is equal to phi of k1, phi of k2. And we can bring that inverse out as well. But that's e exactly equal to x, y inverse. So now reading this around in this loop, we have x, y inverse is equal to this, which is equal to this, which is an element of phi of k. And so by the subgroup test, phi of k is, in fact, a subgroup of h. So what we have is this is a subgroup of h with order n. Okay, good. So that finishes all of these statements, and we're done with this video.